Good morning and welcome to the study and formulating committee on October 30th, 2020. Uh, as we start, I think uh, we'll have uh, Nikki Ecke present the uh, electronic meeting statement. Thank you. At the beginning of the meeting, all committee members participating electronically shall be identified by roll call so that quorum can be established. Um, Justin, could you please call uh, by roll call so that all the com committee members can indicate their presence by roll call uh, vote? Yes, you want me to go ahead and do that now? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I'll be taking a roll call for the study and formulating committee. If you could uh, unmute when I have your name and just stay present. Trish Holliday. Present. You know, uh, Cleophis Rucker is unable to attend. Next, Nick Brassel. Present. Richard Chapman. Present. Kim Stagg. Present. Okay. Roll call has been completed. Okay, thank you. Under the governor's executive order number 65, each time a committee member, staff, or other participant who is using audio-only participation wishes to speak, he or she shall identify themselves in a manner reasonably calculated to permit the public to ascertain the identity of the person speaking. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the governor has issued executive order number 65, authorizing committees to meet and conduct their essential business by electronic means. If the committee determines that meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health safety and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Before considering items on the agenda, the committee needs to determine by roll call vote that the meeting agenda constitutes essential business of the committee and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. All votes during the meeting shall be conducted by roll call. So the next step is for the committee uh, to vote on conducting the meeting electronically. All right, uh, you've heard Nikki's statement. Uh, if we can uh, get, do we need a motion? Yes. Okay. A motion to conduct Kim the meeting. so moved. Sorry. Okay, I was just saying it's a motion to conduct the meeting electronically. Uh, basically a, a motion that the meeting agenda constitutes essential business of the committee and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. So there's a motion, is, uh, is there a second? I'll second. second. Okay, Justin, could you please take the roll call vote? Yes, uh, Ms. Holliday? Uh, yes, I agree. Nick Brassel? Approve. Richard Chapman? I agree. And Kim Stagg? Agreed. Okay, motion passes. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, moving on, uh, you all received the uh, uh, minutes from the previous meeting. Uh, has everyone had a chance to review? And is there any changes? I have no changes. Committee uh, members, do you have any changes? This is Trish Holiday asking. No, I do not. And I'll make a motion that the meetings be approved. This is Kim Stagg. This is Dick Chapman, second. And with the motion, we'll do a roll call for approval. 
Let's see. Trish Holiday. I approve the minutes. Nick Russell. Approved. Richard Chapman. Approve. And Kim Stagg. Approve. Based on the approvals, the approval of the minutes have been approved. Or excuse me, the motion of the minutes have been approved. Before we move on to item number one, uh, it was noted, I think uh, there was a question that came up about our next steps. Uh, Deloitte has explored an option to reduce the OPEB, which was a high priority in the admin M memo and was asked to see how we wanted to proceed with the next steps. Hey, Justin, I didn't understand what you just said. Sorry. That was Trish Holiday, sorry. I apologize. I think uh, before we uh, started on item number one, um, excuse me, I, I think that was moved on. So please, Sorry about that. I think we're going to move on to item number one of the agenda, which is follow-up discussion on the inline of duty program. And I think based on the previous meetings, I think we have some follow-up information uh, and I believe we have Steve Kane here to present. Yes, yeah. good morning. Thank you uh, for having us back to talk about this. At the end of last meeting, there were some questions that were asked. We said we'd get back to you on. Uh, one of the first questions that was asked was, who are the stakeholders in this program? Uh, so after we spoke about that and considered it, um, I'm gonna mention a few to you. First and foremost, it's the employees of the metropolitan government. Um, they are seeking you know, protection from the risks that are out there and getting hurt in the workplace. And then if the unfortunate happens and they are hurt, um, they expect, and we wanna provide them with the best quality care possible. Um, medical quality care as well. Another stakeholder would have to be the Metro departments themselves. Um, they need an IOD program to provide quality care to the employees while also recognizing that there's a value of a comprehensive return to work process. <clears throat> Meaning when the employees are injured, not only do we want to have the quality care, but we wanna have that interactive process with the department between all parties involved, which would be um, Davies Company, who's administering the program, the IOD clinic, uh, the physicians there and the medical care providers there, as well as any of the medical care providers that may be in the specialty network. So we have done that in this program. We bring them all together to make sure there's a comprehensive understanding of how we're gonna return the employee to work. And lastly, obviously a stakeholder is the administration of this metropolitan government. They wanna ensure quality care as well for the employees proper processes for an effective return to work program, as well as maintaining a cost effective IOD program. And I think with some of the numbers that we've presented before, you can see that all those have been obtained. Um, another question that was asked, and I'm gonna to toss this to Director Shannon Hall was, um, that there was a reasoning behind the administration's decision to have the IOD program presented to the study and formulating committee. So at this time, I'll let Shannon address that question. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Um, committee able to um, have a, a very good conversation with the administration to get some clarification as to why they had asked for uh, certain items within their memo to be studied and reviewed. Um, and we specifically got clarification on the um, the IOD component. Um, so I wanted to just go on and read a statement in the record, and then I'm very happy to also speak um, to any clarification that might be needed. Um, from the administration, um, they have stated that per the charter of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, the study and formulating committee is only appointed at least once every five years. Our administration did not wanna miss an opportunity for the expertise of the committee to review any of our major benefit plans. If the committee reviews a program, but does not find further recommendations, validation and affirmation of the program's strategy and management are also helpful and desired. Specifically on injury on duty, we believe that Metro has taken meaningful steps over the past several years to provide our members 
with high quality and a valuable benefit while also implementing strategic cost containment measures. And so we requested a general best practice review for that program. As noted in our uh, September 25th memo, other programs have more detailed recommendations requested. We appreciate your time and attention to all our major programs, and we look forward to either your recommendations or validations as your very important work progresses. Thank you again for your service to Metro. So that's, that is the official statement from the administration. Again, through that very productive conversation, you know, if you've done, if you've done a review of these programs, even a validation and affirmation that the current strategies seem to still be a good and best practice, that validation is helpful and desired so that they know they didn't miss an opportunity to have it looked at. Um, so there are no, you know, fundamentally, they said, we don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong at all with the injury on duty program but hated to miss an opportunity that only comes around once every five years, especially with your expertise. Thank you, uh, Shannon. This is Trish Holiday, and really appreciate that. Sorry, Steve, I just wanted to interject that. No, 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 no. <laughs> You're fine, I agree. If there's no other questions for Shannon, I'll, I'll move on to the uh, next topic. Uh, well, let's let the committee see if there are any other questions for from the committee. And when I say move on to the next topic, I am still continuing with the IOD program. I just have uh, more questions to answer that were proposed last week or two weeks ago. Okay, okay thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Nikki Eke. Steve, since you're using audio participation, uh, could you please identify yourself each time uh, before you start speaking? Thank you. This is Steve. Yes, I'll, I'll be sure to do so. Okay. Steve Kane continuing. So if there aren't any questions, um, I'm gonna move on to the next questions that were asked last week, which we were um, questioned about some of the numbers of IOD totals uh, and number of people going through the clinic. So um, all the data we had presented two weeks ago was uh, for an entire year. So we used 2019 as our year to reflect upon, unless I had otherwise specified when we had gone back in time to look at uh, total numbers over a span. So in 2019, the total number of what we call the 101 claim form, uh, there were 2,123 total. So that's quite a bit of claim forms. Now out of those 2,100, only 796 of those were actually what they call report only, meaning that the employee did not seek medical treatment. And that can happen for various reasons that an employee suspected that they were exposed to something that could later make them sick, or maybe they uh, did fall or uh, have some type of accident, but didn't sustain a medical injury at that time. And they still documented that in case the injury were to surface at a later date, uh, which is also very important that we track those so the safety coordinators can identify how did that accident happen and how do we prevent that from happening again. So out of the over the 2,100 claims, uh, as I said, almost 800 were report only, and that left a little over 1,300 that actually were sought some type of treatment. Out of all those, 86% of those started off going through the Metro IOD clinic. That was 10,000, I'm excuse me, 1,058 went through the IOD clinic. Total for 2019, total visits, meaning how many visits did the IOD clinic see, which could also mean it's not just the employee's initial visit, but any follow-up, they had 2,951, so almost 3,000 visits to the IOD clinic last year. And then in addition to that, they performed over 3,100 drug and alcohol screenings for Metro departments as well. So those are the numbers that were asked about what are we looking at with total claims, who sought medical treatment, and how many started off and went through the IOD clinic. Lastly, a question was asked about what improvements can be made to the IOD program? You wanted us to go back and talk uh, amongst ourselves and, and bring you back something. So after discussing this with the administrative staff and some of our stakeholders, we strongly believe that focusing on the safety program is most important at this time. Department safety coordinators need the training and the support of a central safety office to identify and remove the risk from the workplace. A uh, strong safety program can assist with safety training efforts, not only for frontline employees, but also the supervisors and managers 
who they are the ones who make the biggest impact on reducing injuries in the workplace. So again, any issues that we have seen over the past several years that arise in the IOD program, we have uh, incredible involvement, not only from uh, the union standpoint, the employees, the departments, but all of our vendors as well, and all those key stakeholders. And it seems that we have done a, you know, I'm reflecting on them, not, not us as HR. They have done a tremendous job on helping us always find some type of solution to any, any efforts or problems that we have that arise in this program. So again, we focus back on let's prevent the injuries by uh, fostering a stronger safety program across Metro altogether. So that kind of summarizes the questions that were brought to us. Um, I'm, I'm free to answer any questions uh, you may have at this time. And then I know also too, I think others are, um, Justin will direct us if others have an opportunity or needed to speak to about this program. Thank you. Steve, this is Trish Holiday. I uh, wanted to clarify one thing. Um, is it, um, is it currently, I'm trying to check my understanding in all the reports that we've received and all the feedback, which by the way, I appreciate everybody's hard work in getting a statement uh, from administration and then helping us find clarity in this space. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about the central safety office. Is it my understanding that we currently do not have it centralized? That's correct. The, the The history of the program was it, it was centralized and it had moved from benefits to HR back when they combined as a department and then went from HR to Metro Legal. Uh, they had a central safety division and that's where uh, under the Metro uh, resolutions right now, it, it resides in legal, uh, but they actually don't have a, a staff running that right now. So what we're doing is HR, myself, and then some of my coworkers, we are assisting those departments with their safety needs. Um, I have a um, part of my background is in safety. Uh, the rest of it's in HR. And so they rely on us to, let me put it this way. There are some departments that have full-time safety coordinators. They are very well informed about OSHA regulations uh, and preventative measures in the workplace. You have a greater number of departments who don't have a position solely uh, set aside for safety. And those employees need quite a bit of help understanding what is safety, what, what are my responsibilities and how do I reduce the injuries? So that's why there needs to be a central safety office. So there is a plan moving forward and the administration is behind this. And I just think it's a matter of time with everything that we're facing right now with uh, financial issues, COVID, et cetera, that that will be supported and, um, we're not sure where it'll be at this time. Ideally, it may be moved back into HR, but yes, th there's not one now, but we are helping them as needed. And our office is a liaison between Tennessee OSHA and the departments uh, when need be. So okay, there's, there's a small vacuum right now, yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you for answering that. This is Trish Holiday, and I will, um, just to put closure on that, and then I'll let the rest of the committee, if they have anything, uh, I wanted to, uh, acknowledge that would this be an area where this committee if we so determined that this might be a recommendation that we would support the ongoing efforts for a centralized um, safety office is that something that this committee could help validate those efforts in some way this is Steve Kane again. I'll let maybe Nikki or Shannon speak to the um, what the, this committee can and can't do. I'm, I'm unsure, but yes, I'm telling you from my point of view, any support for this uh, is, is recognized and appreciated. So yeah, I was just talking about this is Trish Holiday. I was just talking about um, if um, if it if it would be in our scope. to for that to be part of our recommendation. So I was just seeking clarification on that. Here. Uh, this is Nikki Ake. Okay. Yes, uh, it's an issue that pertains to injury on duty and injury on duty medical care is under the jurisdiction of the committee. So the committee can certainly make recommendations regarding safety issues that, you know, have an impact on, on injury, workplace okay, thank injury. You. Thank you, Nikki. This is Trish Holiday. I appreciate that. This is Steve King. Oh, Justin, I'm 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 done with my portion of presentation. All right, thank you, Steve. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, this is Dick Chapman. Um, 
During this discussion, I think Mr. Smallwood from the uh, FOP uh, raised the issue of PTSD treatment. And I was, I had some questions and let me just run through those. Um, how are those services provided presently? How are the cases identified? And, you know, what is Metro currently doing for, and I would assume that this is primarily a public safety issue, but could actually appear in any number of places uh, in the workforce. Just wondering what's going on at present. Okay, this is Steve Kane. I'll be glad to address that. Okay, so <clears throat> currently, Metro IOD program applies the Tennessee Worker Comp Guide on mental and psychological. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Tennessee courts state that in order to prevail in one of these claims for mental injury, that the injured employee must prove by preponderance of evidence that one, that there is a mental injury as a result of an identifiable stress, stressful work related event, and that two, the event be produced a sudden mental stimulus, such as a fright, a shock, <clears throat> or excessive unexpected anxiety. And three, that the stress produced was extraordinary and unusual in comparison to stress ordinarily experienced by an employee in the same type of duties. So as advised by Metro Legal, <clears throat> excuse me, years back, the benefit board traditionally looked at the worker compensation laws for precedent in interpreting the application of the Metro code to mental and psychological disabilities. So legal advised that those guidelines be utilized in making the recommendations on such issues. And specifically the guidelines presented by legal at that time stated one, what was the specific work related event or events that caused the mental injury Two did the event subject the employee to the sudden stimulus such as fright, shock, or, or excessive unexpected anxiety, as opposed to a gradual buildup of stress over time? And three, was the stress caused by an event extraordinary or unusual compared to stress, again, experienced by someone in the same type of career path or same type of duties? So the claim for psychological injury is presented and filed just like any other injury claim. Uh, on the injury claim form, which goes to Davies Company, who then uh, investigates, speaks to the department, and makes the initial determination. And any determination made by them, as with any other injury claim, can be appealed to the benefit board, first to the IOD committee, and then to the full board. Looking back in time, um, 2019, we received four psychological claims uh, all four were denied because they didn't meet the standard and none of those had appealed. In 2020, uh, even though I've been reflecting full years, thus far this year, we received eight total claims. Six of those were denied. And out of those six, four appealed, three are still pending. One was actually overturned. <clears throat> we have another one that's under review right now. And then one other this year was accepted as one of those claims. So what appears to be, um, I know it's a challenging and difficult situation uh, to under understand when does Metro accept this as an injury claim. Um, I want it to be known that they, these employees still have access to care. Not only does the personal insurance carriers have mental health available through them, but then we also have an EAP program for all Metro employees. And then also the some of the departments like police and fire have their own professional organizations where the employees can also go and seek uh, mental health uh, assistance or medical care as well, guidance toward that. So um, that's the standard we use to apply it. That's how we handle it. Uh, again, identified by ASC and then uh, all appeals can go back before the benefit board to be reviewed again if need be. Thank you. So this is Justin. Uh, do we have any other questions? I think we're ready. This is Trish Holiday. I think we're ready to move on. Okay. 
Uh, with nothing else, moving on to item number two, listed as union comments. Um, at this time, I believe that we have um, Mark Young, who is requested to present or speak. Yes, am I, am I on? Yes, you're on, we can hear you. Okay, I guess, um, Richard, um, I was the one who uh, last meeting raised the question about PTSD. Um, I'll get to that just in a second. Did, did the committee members receive uh, the information that I submitted or sent over? Yes. Yes, we did. Mrs. Holiday. It came to us last night. Last night? Yesterday afternoon. <clears throat> Well, you probably didn't get a chance to review it uh, in detail, but uh, just to highlight some of the uh, pieces that are there, if the city, normally the city, when they um, study benefits, uh, they're looking at also a way to save money um, in the, uh, in the benefit. And if you look at the stuff that was uh, sent over, uh, one huge IOD uh, cost uh, to the fire service is inadequate staffing. And um, 20 years ago, the fire department actually ran four man minimums on every piece of equipment um, over the years as run volumes has increased uh, in this city, uh, staffing has de decreased, which um, would have anybody asking, well, that doesn't make any sense. So the documents I sent you, you you'll see that IOD injuries increased by 50% by four man staffing versus three man uh, staffing. And we run with three men in this city. So if they want to reduce um, IOD injuries in the fire service, uh, running four men on every piece of equipment would be a, make a, make a huge difference in IOD claims. Um, Another thing I sent over was I would ask the committee to review and see if it makes sense for our presumptive claims to go to a review uh, panel of doctors here in, in Nashville. Presently, they go somewhere in Texas and many times the reviews come back um, with um, information or, or denials with information that they reviewed was not correct. Uh, they'll, they'll say a member, you know, is just, for instance, say uh, is um, overweight real bad. Well, the member will be present at a benefit board meeting on an appeal and even benefit board members sometimes will scratch their head and say, they don't look overweight to me. So what I'm asking is, is could the committee at least make a recommendation that the reviews take place here locally and the reviewer can actually uh, see the patient and talk to the patient and doing their own examination and make a determination. And then talking about the PTSD, what Steve was explaining is, is correct. There's programs uh, for this uh, through the personal insurance. And the fire department has actually recently created two full-time positions plus about 25 peer supporters that volunteer because the department has recognized the issue of PTSD and has made a proactive approach 
to reach out to the employee that that is uh, uh, seeking this help, and and it's all it, it's all great what they're doing, but basically all they do is refer the employee in a direction to a uh, provider, and that's great also. But what we're asking is during this time that the employee is seeking this professional help, that the time be covered IOD, just like any other injury. Um, the threshold to meet a qualification for PTSD is huge uh, for, for a claim. And I think, I think that needs to be looked at. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you from experience that I've been before the benefit board and some members on this benefit board do not believe that firefighter or an EMS personnel can have PTSD because we're trained to deal with this. Well, let me tell you, there is no training to deal with PTSD. And then I've heard some benefit board members even make comments that you knew what you was getting into when you took this job. I'm just, I'm just asking that if it makes sense for this committee to send something back to the administration that if someone is seeking professional help because of this job and they need some time away that it be covered IOD instead of using their uh, own sit time. We have, we have someone right now that has used every vacation day, every sick day, every day on the book and now is out of time and we'll be going into what we will call losing time because they have a mental injury on this job. And I, I you know, I, I, we need to review this. Um, I guess that's all I got. This is Steve Payne. Justin, if, uh, if you or anyone else doesn't mind, I'd like to respond to some of those things. Yes, this is Trish Holliday. Steve, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Trish. This is Steve Kane again. <clears throat> um, first, I hope I understand where Mark's coming from, and I hope he doesn't believe that um, anyone on the administration does not believe that the employee has suffered PTSD. Um, I recognize and appreciate that probably uh, more than some others who are not currently in EMS and fire, as I was once in EMS years ago, so I completely understand that. I believe um, what we express with an administration over the program is that under the criteria for what is accepted as a psychological injury hasn't been met. But at no point do we ever say or believe the employee does not actually have an injury or saw something that is uh, psychologically disturbing, mentally disturbing. We understand that. Um, second, about the IOD time, um, that's actually something that is governed by the Civil Service Commission. So although departments typically follow the IOD injury and whether or not it was deemed acceptable under medical care, they still have the authority under civil service rules to look at any IOD claim and that can be weighed in differently or accepted under the time-wise, even though it may not be accepted under medical care. Um, the PTSD uh, team, the uh, stress team that was put together at fire department, um, Mark's correct, they just uh, added and, and fostered that program. I've been actually a part of that program with the fire department uh, under the previous uh, staff that was running it and I've been invited back to the current staff that's running that program. So we're invested, uh, HR's invested, the administration's invested even down to that level of wanting to help uh, within the department. Um, so that's the issues I want to talk about under PTSD. As far as the medical reviews, uh, I know Mark has said that these medical reviews are occurring in Texas. 
Um, we use ASC to adjudicate these claims, uh, the presumption, the heart hypertension uh, and cancer claims. And the company that Ekman Freeman, who is our case management company, they're the ones who subcontract the company. Uh, they're currently using a company called Reliable Reviews Services, RRS for short. Uh, they're currently located in Florida, but he's right. The previous company, their corporate headquarters was in Texas. So a lot of times you would see addresses or something from Texas, but really their physicians were all over. Um, all the reviewers on the board are certified physicians. They take the same board and have the same certifications regardless of what state they reside in or where they practice and all use evidence-based criteria for the basis of all their reviews. We didn't find, um, uh, you know, we went back and we looked. I know at one point someone said, hey, we used an orthopedic doctor to look at a cardiac case. We didn't find that. Uh, what we do recognize is that many of the physicians that are on these review panels um, will hold multiple certifications. So they may be certified in cardiology, internal medicine, or orthopedic all at the same time. Um, but we almost, we always uh, align with whatever the type of injury is with that specific type of doctor. Again, whether it be cardiology, internal medicine, dermatology, uh, oncology, pulmonology, urology, we have all those available in this network of physicians. Um, so we can choose those uh, you know, as we need to, but what we've tried to do and what ASC, uh, Eggman Freeman and RS has tried to do is in the recent years, They've only used the same nine type of doctors spread throughout those specialties because we want to make sure that they're acquainted with the Metro presumptions and the Tennessee presumptions. And these physicians are dealing with presumption cases all over the U.S. for all other states and entities where there are presumption claims. So it is nothing new to these physicians to be looking at these presumptions. Uh, and lastly, I just want to point out, we've asked about, um, hey, what about Nashville? What about Tennessee physicians? And RSS has told us, look, we are constantly recruiting. Tennessee is one of the hardest states to recruit from because it's a very close-knit medical community of physicians that just simply don't want to review their peers. We also have asked, and, and, and RSS, RRS, excuse me, has made sure that we use URAC accredited uh, companies and physicians. And currently there are no companies that are URAC certified in Tennessee. Um, but they know we want, you know, to have a great set of doctors. We are working with them closely. If we have issues with any physicians, then we can choose someone else in that specialty. Um, but again, they're all board certified. Uh, we're continuously looking for other doctors and we're continuing addressing any concerns that we have with that program. So. That's all I have uh, to present on that. If y'all have any follow-up questions, feel free. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. This is Trish Holliday. Appreciate your response. And committee members, uh, do I have any uh, committee members that have any questions at this at this particular point in time in response to Mark's remarks or Mark's remarks? <laughs> Just throw a little humor in there. Um, uh, Mark's remarks or um, Steve's uh, response. Committee members, any any questions or thoughts, response to that? Ms. Holiday, I do have some questions. This is Kim Stagg. Yes, thank you, Kim. Uh, Mr. Kane or Mr. Young, are, are you aware um, with the ever increasing focus on mental illness, if benefit boards are establishing sub boards or subcommittees to do an initial review of PTSD or other um, mental illness cases before they go before the full um, board review for recommendation by the subcommittee? If you're aware of any best practices in that regard, it would be helpful to know about that. This is Steve Payne. I'm unaware of other jurisdictions, cities, states um, who, I, I'm unfamiliar with their program. I, I do recognize our program having that subcommittee. 
uh, has been, I think, a valuable thing because uh, they're able to actually flush out and hear all sides and all parties uh, to a great extent in great detail before going to the full board to let them make decisions. Um, but I can't speak to other jurisdictions as being the best practice. Um, but it definitely is something, you know, now that you mentioned that, that we, we will put on our radar and always kind of, as we always do, look for improvements in this program. This is Dick Chapman. I had a, a question about the two positions that were added or identified in the fire department. Um, what is the background of the, the position requirements there? This is Steve Payne. I would have to defer. Maybe Mark can answer that. Um, I was only invited as a guest. Uh, I wasn't part of the uh, team at the fire de in-house fire department to create that. They just invited me as a liaison to HR into our EAP program to help them. So I want to hear how they came about that, Mark. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chapman. So the um, the the chairperson of the um, peer support program which is a full-time position uh, to um, look at several areas of uh, PTSD. It could be substance abuse. Um, it, it, it could be a lot of, lot of areas. And, and this person that's in charge of that has um, a lot of training and has been through uh, a lot of courses to be certified as someone that um, is able to recognize uh, these uh, illnesses. And the other position is actually a chaplain uh, position. And this would be someone who is uh, an ordained minister uh, that is uh, has a position that also uh, is available and reaches out to uh, uh, someone that's needing uh, th this type of uh, help. And, and, and they're, they're, they're also there, they're like if, uh, this is to say that uh, uh, today uh, the, the department makes a, a bad call, uh, whether it be something dealing with a house fire or automobile accident or something, this team will reach out to that, to the, te to the station or the crews that uh, actual made the call and uh, reach out to them and ask them if they need uh, need to get out of service for a little while, and uh, talk about uh, what what just took place. So, it's a great program. I'm glad the department done it, and I think you know all, all I'm asking is that that we take a serious look at this, and when we have an employee that is suffering uh, from this mental illness, that the time that they're away from the job, seeking counseling and talking to the professionals, that this time is IOD time. And Steve explained something that, you know, I, I guess I th should have known was about, I, I know the benefit board does not deal with time. That's dealt with through the Civil Service Commission. I've always known that, but they kind of go, they, they tie into each other. Uh, and if the department, you know, maybe this is somewhere I need to start working on the department with is getting the time covered. We know the treatment is covered. It's, we're not, we're not having any problems with, uh, the treatment. We even, our international union even has a recovery center, uh, that is excellent and, uh, we will send, and the union will even pay for the transportation to send someone to this center if need be. So the medical side of this is not a problem whatsoever. It is the time that we're dealing with, and uh, uh, this day forward, I'm going to work with the department and see if we can get that changed in some kind of way. Thank you. This is Dick Chapman again. So. To a certain extent, you're looking for recognition from the Civil Service Commission of time off to seek this treatment. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chapman, yes, that's correct. Mr. Okay. And, 
Go ahead. Not, I'm sorry, this is Shannon Hall. I, I just want to clarify the to Mr. Young's point um, and a prior point I think I made the last meeting. Um, IOD time and time off that, that Mr. Young is interested in, that is governed, quote, under civil service. The civil service rules give that authority to the department. So the commission doesn't necessarily have control, quote, over the IOD days. The commission grants departments the authority to determine IOD time, if that makes any sense. It makes lots of sense. Um, this is Dick Chapman again. Answer, answer a question for me. If, for example, the fire department wanted to authorize uh, two EMS personnel who had a tough run, uh, wanted to authorize time for them to use the employee assistance program to get counseling. One, does the employee have to make any financial contribution to participate in, for example, the first five sessions in an employee assistance program? And number two, could the fire department authorize IOD pay for a one of the EMS personnel who's basically not on duty, but to get, receive counseling is in a positive pay status during that time? So to answer your first question, Mr. Chapman, um, the employee does not contribute to the EAP program that is 100% funded by the metropolitan government and the administration through HR. Okay. And while there is a, a cap on a number of sessions, it is well beyond typically a, a five session. I think off the top of my head, it may be as many as a dozen or more. So okay. the employee is free to, the employee and any person in the employee's household, regardless of uh, what department they're in, have that as a benefit free of charge, no matter what they're facing, whether okay. I think to Mark's point, whether it's a direct, um, you know, mental health issue that's going on or some of those secondary issues, which can be quite problematic, substance abuse, uh, leading to other financial issues, et cetera. The second question is the department unilaterally under civil service rules has the authority to grant time off if the employee requests it for that reason and has the authority to grant that as IOD time should they choose to do so. Okay, so uh, an EMS person in that instance could work a regular shift but get, for lack of a better term, outpatient counseling at it when they're normally off duty but be in a positive pay status at that time. We don't pay people for off duty, it would be for an employee that was unable to make their shift as a result of that care or treatment okay. or the anguish associated with that, if I understand at least Mr. Young's point. Yeah. So if they worked a regular shift, they'd get regular pay. If as a result of this, um, this PTSD and their seeking of care, they missed part of or an entire another shift, the department does have the unilateral authority under civil service rules to grant IOD time. I think that's true of any department, including my own. Okay, but there's not, what you're saying is there's not the flexibility to basically pay somebody an hour or two of overtime to get outpatient counseling and continue to work their shift. Correct, that would be governed under federal regulations like FLSA. So, okay. you know, we only pay overtime for actual hours worked if that meets that standard. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You can have, uh, Richard, uh, to your point also, and uh, Shannon, so the department, uh, this does not happen uh, as we're speaking. What does happen is if an employee is seeking uh, IOD for PTSD or any, or matter of fact, any claim, uh, if it's granted, what ends up, when, what, what ends up happening is the department goes back and converts that sick time or vacation time that was used during the determination period. If they are approved IOD, then those days are back on the books of the employee and the days that were off or IOD days. Uh, that's how it presently works. But if I go to the safety office right now or pick the phone up and call right now and say, hey, can you give ex-employee 
IOD time for their PTSD, they're going to be out for the next 15 days. The answer they will give me is we're waiting on this. We're, we, we are waiting to see if it is going to be covered or approved IOD. That would be the answer. Committee, are there any other uh, any other questions or remarks? Ms. Holiday, it's Kim Stegg. I have another question. Yes, Kim. Mr. Mr. Young, I appreciate that you sent us the studies related to um, four-man requirements versus three-man requirements. One of those studies is from 1994 and one is from 2010. If you ultimately find there are any more updated studies, I think it would be very helpful for this committee to see more updated studies if they are available. Second, if you're aware of any technology or equipment changes that have been implemented by Metro that justify the change from four-man to three-man, um, it would be helpful to understand that. Um, and whether the issue is one that Metro has not yet been able to invest in that new technology and equipment, um, or, 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 or if you know th these studies still support the idea that we could reduce injuries significantly um, by going back to a four-man. That makes sense. Yes, uh, yes, it does. And uh, the studies I sent you that was. Uh, some studies that we um, was uh, put together back in 2010, and that's just I had it just ready available to send over. That's what you've got, and we haven't. Uh, I mean, I can get some updated results. Uh, the results will not change far as uh, the IOD injury versus on the personnel. Uh, and your your question to uh, what changes have been made possibly throughout the years. Uh, I, I think you're referring to like safety equipment and stuff like that. Yes, there has been some improvements like uh, hearing devices. Uh, we we now wear uh, all the new equipment that come in has headphones, so we're not getting uh, ear damage from the sirens, uh, stuff like that. Some of the turnout gear is being uh, produced uh, in a way that's uh, uh, helping on uh, burns and stuff like that. So the equipment, I will say that we have a great safety committee that uh, is always looking at the latest technology and uh, the department is always on board to providing the best PPE available to the employee. So, but to your question, I'll, I'll see if I can find you some more recent three man versus four man. Thank you. Uh, this is Dick Chapman. I've got, I have a specific observation about that. Uh, I think what you'll find is the fire department's been, the authorized positions in the fire department has been kept constant while the responsibility for running the EMS program has been absorbed by that existing staffing. And as a consequence, the number of people riding the fire suppression equipment has been reduced in favor of putting people on ambulances because the department took on extra work. Uh, Mr. Chapman, you're exactly right. That's exactly how it took place. As the city uh, seen the need to add more uh, ambulances to the street, uh, instead of uh, the uh, administration or the mayor's budget authorizing uh, positions for the increased ambulance uh, services. That's exactly right. They, uh, they, they take them out of the suppression division and the FTEs have not changed. Uh, so, uh, but one thing that has changed in this city is uh, uh, population, uh, the number of automobiles on the street, uh, run volumes, uh, our, our call, our calls have increased. Uh, they've um, actually have almost doubled in 20 years, with the same uh, or less number of personnel uh, that we had 20, 25 years ago.
This is Justin. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments regarding the IOD program? All right. Uh, before we move on, uh, I just wanted to see, based on the initial discussion we had with the IOD program on the uh, the location of the central safety office, uh, is that something that the committee would like to make as a recommendation? This is Trish Holliday. I think we as a committee, one of the things we're doing right now, Justin uh, and committee, please feel free to weigh in, but I think we're trying to gather as much information and insight as possible. And I think we'll need further conversation around what we ultimately think should be any recommendations and what we want to validate and affirm to um, uh, respond to Shannon's administrative uh, statement. And so I want to make sure we have ample time to discuss that. I do not feel like we're ready to say that is a recommendation. Committee, if you have another opinion, please share that now. Hey, Justin, Brad Brazen looks like he has his hand up from SEIU. All right. Solid, do you want to uh, uh, wait for the committee to speak or would you like to bring uh, Mr. Rayson in to ask a question? Uh, absolutely, Mr. Rayson, uh, feel free to come on in. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just uh, wanted to comment on, on some of the matters that you've been talking about concerning PTSD, uh, you know, Mark's members and uh, James members have a lot more exposure, but we do represent uh, employees at 911. Uh, and if you've ever listened to a 911 call, you know it can get your heart racing uh, as almost as fast if you're on the scene. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with with Mark's observation that the the current standard is a pretty high bar, of, and that the employee has to establish meeting all three of the criteria. Uh, that are outlined in, in the state law. Uh, and I just wonder uh, whether for first responders using a generally applicable standard for, for a mental illness or injury uh, is appropriate. Um, as I listened to, to Mr. Kane's uh, uh, recitation of the criteria, it didn't seem like there was a recognition of the cumulative impact of repeated stressful situations on employees uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of illnesses and this may be characterized as an illness do uh, do have a, a cumulative source rather than an immediate single incident source which it seemed like the this the current standard applies there so those are just some observations i had that i wanted to share with with you thank you Thank you, Brad. This is Trish Holliday. I appreciate your remarks, and uh, I also appreciate um, uh, that we were able to recognize you. And Ginger, thanks for letting us know that. Uh, committee, um, I'm coming to you now for any remarks, any thoughts, any further questions. And do we have any more uh, any more comments or discussion that we want to have on this IOD section? Um, but, and I don't, I want you also to answer my earlier question on, um, if you're ready to make, to identify recommendations, or is it appropriate to say that we'll have that discussion later? I agree that I think it would probably be good to be able to digest this just a little bit, um, and be able to discuss it. Thank you, Nick. Kim, your thoughts? Ms. Holiday, I think we should put it on the potential list, and then I think this committee should review all the potential recommendations and then finalize those in, yes. in, our, in our comprehensive report. Thank you, Kim. Uh, uh, that, is, that is also what I was uh, thinking we should do as well. And uh, Dick, uh, what, is your, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, uh, I agree with that because I, I think um, we can add some value to some of the comments that we've heard. Um, 
but it's going to require a little more flexibility than what is in the current system. And I think that's something we need to kind of kick around a little bit. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Justin, I think um, as a committee, we are we are at a uh, resting, I won't say stopping, I'll say resting point with the IOD program. And um, I would like to move us to the other issues in the administration memo. We have no other uh, discussions around the IOD program. This is Justin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I will keep the IOD program discussion um, on the table, but once you guys are ready for further discussion, we'll bring that back at that time. Uh, based on the administration's memo um, and the discussions previously on the reduction of OPEB, is there a direction that the committee would like to take uh, go forward in the next meeting or follow-up meetings on what items to bring. Thank you, Justin. This is Trish Holliday. I uh, would like the committee to remind the committee that in the administration memo, we had uh, several items to consider. We had uh, pension, we had medical care, we had the IOD, and we had financial well-being. I would like to ask the committee what uh, topic would we like to study next in our review and where would we like to go next? Because I think that'll help frame our next uh, meeting content. So I'm asking Dick, Kim and uh, Nick, uh, what would be your interest? What are those items that I read out that came in the administration memo? What would be a uh, good topic for us to broach next? This is Nick. I think I would be in favor of looking at um, probably the, the retirement pension. Uh, basically, I mean, based, especially based on the fact that that seemed to be one of the top concerns. Um, so more time, I think, on the front end that we can identify for that. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Dick and Kim, do you support us looking into now the uh, pension topic as the next area of study? I'm fine with that. Uh, I would tell you quite honestly that if, if you look at the most recent two reports from our predecessors, they tried to deal with the OPEB, the other post-employment benefit issues, and they're the, gonna be the toughest ones to wrestle with if there's any thoughts of meaningful changes. So this is uh, Trish Holliday. Uh, so to Nick's comment that we might need to uh, attack that early. Maybe we need to, based on what you just said, to go ahead and uh, look at it so that we have enough time to do so. Well, looking looking at the retirement plan itself, uh, it seems to be well funded. The employees are generally pleased with that, based on the survey information we have. Um, it does appropriate takes appropriate steps towards recognizing the difference between regular employment and public safety employment and those types of things. Um, you know, it's about 85% funded. That's a pretty good, pretty good statement. Um, it might also give us a chance to get our, our uh, legs a little more steady looking at that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And basically the same people I think are doing the work on pension financing as are doing the OPEB estimates, if I remember correctly. And if you go out on the on some of the stuff that's out on the Metro website, you can read the OPEB report and the the notes on the fiscal reviews about how well funded or not well funded those things are. Yeah. Thank you, Dick. Uh, Kim, are you in support of the pension topic? 
A absolutely, yes, I am. I think it's going to be a very difficult topic, and we need time for it, and, and we need to dig into it. So, uh, thank you. Madam Chair? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Justin. Um, in hearing some uh, some of the comments uh, about the OPEB and re reducing the OPEB liability, I, I'm just going to throw this out there as an option. I know that, as uh, Mr. Chairman was stating, that the pension fund is fully funded. Um, I don't know if, uh, based on previous discussions, the OPEB liability reducing, uh, if you want to look at the medical uh, as far as possible changes uh, in, in the near future or in the next couple meetings. I just wanted to throw that out there as an option if you're looking at going down the, uh, the direction of reviewing the OPEB liability. Yeah, this, is Dick, this is Dick Chairman again. Let me be clear. Uh, I view the the word pension as the financial support that somebody receives after they qualify to receive that financial support after they terminate employment. OPEB is a separate issue that is uh, dealing primarily with medical insurance, in the case of Metro also with life insurance, for individuals who have terminated employment but our continuing participation in health insurance. And there, the, the OPEB requirements are due to some changes in uh, reporting requirements from the Government Accounting Standards Board that took a place about 10 years ago, maybe a little longer, uh, that require um, states and municipalities to add uh, notes to their fiscal statements about potential long-term obligations for that. Thank you for that, uh, for the, your clarification. This is Trish yes. Holliday. And um, Justin, one of the things, if it, if it was okay with, with you all, and Shannon, if you, if you feel good about this, if we could look at the pension topic at our next meeting, and then after that review, we'll move to medical care. If you're okay with that order with this committee, if you support that, then I think that's what we would like to do. I think kind of as, as Justin stated and, and Chair Holiday, as you've mentioned, I think the committee has the right to study in, in the order and preference that they determine. Um, I think to Mr. Chapman's point, because I like to boil things down because all this gets very confusing, especially with all the fun acronyms that governments like to throw, local, state, and federal. Um, to Mr. Chapman's point, pension is really that, that, that pension benefit, that pension payment you get as a result of your service to Metro once you retire, right? That OPEB benefit is really the retiree medical, and in his, as he pointed out correctly, also a, a life insurance benefit that comes to our pensioners as well. So when we say OPEB, it's really retiree medical, and then pension is the, the actual payment they get for the service time. I think that's totally fine, and I think we can prepare what you need. Um, the You obviously have seen um, how people feel about that within Metro, generally speaking from the workforce inside assessment. We're happy to prepare some information that kind of outlines some of the changes that uh, the 2012 study and formulating committee made, they made some very um, significant and substantial changes um, that are meant to reward long-term employment uh, that got unanimous recommendations from the board, but did scale back that benefit in order to be more cost-effective for the people we were delivering that benefit to. So I think that's part of that whole discussion and we're happy to prepare information and kind of walk you through what has occurred in the past 10 years. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Thank you, Shannon. This is Trish Holiday. I, uh, to the committee, I would like to um, spend our last few moments on this meeting thinking about what we would like for Shannon and her team to bring to us for our next meeting so that we have time to do our homework, get what we need, any advanced information that we need to look at prior to our next meeting. But let's, as a committee, think through really quickly now uh, a list of things or, or identify some items that would be helpful, excuse me, for us to understand what, what is currently happening, 
maybe that that look as Shannon uh, raised in terms of changes since 2012, how those have been implemented, so that we have a good understanding of the current program. Committee, what would you like to see uh, or hear about? Or um, I definitely want to put in that we hear from 2012, the changes that were recommended and how those are being implemented. So I definitely would like to see that. Committee, what else would we like to look at as we study this topic of pension? Trish, my apologies. I have to go get on a one o'clock court hearing, but I, I will think about your question and um, have some answers at the ready for, for next time. This is Dick Chapman. I think for our next meeting, it would be appropriate to have perhaps the pension actuary come in, review the status of how they consider the pension funding, and perhaps review the process that Metro goes through to set the, um, the contribution rates and the benefits. Okay, um, Shannon, is that, this is Trish Holiday. Shannon, is that uh, something your team can help uh, prepare? Absolutely. I was gonna say our, our team at Finley, frankly, already has all of that information. It's just something we do on an annual basis as legally required and as ethically appropriate with the Employee Benefit Board. So putting that information together and then boiling it down, I think also just a high level um, component about um, the current benefit and how that was meaningfully changed in 20, effective 1 1 2013, right? We went from a five year vesting period to a 10 year vesting period. Um, ironically, it does start to trickle into um, the OPEB liability we've talked about, but that retiring medical portion, there were substantial changes in a comprehensive set of legislation that was recommended by the study and formulating committee in 2012 unanimously recommended by the Employee Benefit Board and then substantiated in code by council. Um, so it's gonna change, for example, the cost sharing benefit for retiree medical uh, for those people. So um, I think we're happy to kind of give you like a really high level review and then let our actuaries really speak to kind of the current level of funding and how they're making recommended contribution rates. They've touched on that a little bit, but we are certainly happy to do that again. And thank you. This is Trish Holiday. I appreciate that. And I think that would uh, uh, provide us the content for our next meeting. So we'd have a high level presentation from uh, your team on, on the current pension program and what's happening and those how those changes were in, implemented. And then we will hear from the actuaries to make sure we have full understanding from that. So if the committee's in agreement, Dick and Nick, if you all approve, then that will be the content of our next meeting. So I just need to hear from you. That sounds good to me. Sounds good to me as well. All right, thanks. Holiday? Yes. Uh, in just, if I may, I think just in, uh, in advance in case this question does come up and through the um, productive conversations we had getting clarification from the administration, certainly a review of the pension is welcome as they've outlined in their memo. Um, I suspect based on those conversations, this may be another case of please study and validation, even if they're not recommendations are also welcome. I definitely got the impression in my conversation that pension also kind of fell into that. And I don't wanna uh, make assumptions or overstep my bounds, but I felt, I felt pretty clear from the conversation I had with the administration that both IOD and pension, the administration doesn't necessarily think there's anything fundamentally wrong, but would welcome your study and review. Okay, that sounds great. This is uh, uh, Chairman Holiday, and I um, I think that's a great way to start out. And once we get a high level understanding and can look at and hear from who we need to, then we can go from there. Uh, so I appreciate that. And that'll be the content of our next meeting. And then I'll be sending some dates to Christina and committee members. Please send some dates that uh, let me go ahead and send my dates and then she'll come at, She'll come to you all with uh, dates that work to see how we can coordinate our next meetings. Can I ask, uh, this is Dick Chapman, can I ask Shannon Hall a question? Uh, how willing is the administration to take on the OPEB issue? Um, 
I think I think the important component is that we realize, and again, I'm speaking on behalf. I mean, OPEB is I'm not the finance person, right? So OPEB is not my problem, but benefit administration does directly impact that cost, right? So I would say that even within our realm, because our goal is to help to provide comprehensive benefits for our entire metro population, but do so in a cost-effective manner. And that, that's gonna help us preserve the longevity of our entire benefit system. I will say that um, I think probably as many of you know, there's no magic silver bullet to addressing OPEB liabilities. It's generally a collection of strategies. Um, I personally believe that the 2013 legislation was a very significant, meaningful step towards addressing the, the capping and reduction to those liabilities by um, shifting some of the cost share based on years of service. And that is currently in the code today, effective for anybody hired um, as of January 1, 2013. We have um, tried to brainstorm even within house and with the administration about what we hope would be low hanging fruit options that would help us to address OPEB liability. Um, and one of those options Deloitte has studied uh, with us and we think is a good low hanging fruit option and they are prepared to present um, that for your consideration when you're ready to study it. So this is uh, Chairman Holiday. I, uh, I think um, it would be important to hear from them. So I think we should we should make sure that's on the list of what we want to hear about. Committee, is there anything else? Uh, we'll get those dates to you for date options for next uh, our next meetings. I'm gonna give you time back in your life today as we have completed this particular uh, meeting. And Justin, I appreciate your leadership uh, in today's meeting. We missed Christine, but you were a fantastic replacement. And um, the rest of the committee look for those dates to get our next meeting set. Do I have any, any other uh, comments from the committee before I turn it back to Justin? Okay, Justin, it's yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. Uh, if there is nothing else to discuss or any other comments, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, if there's nothing else, I hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Uh, well, Justin, since you asked for a motion, do you want to just go ahead and ask them to just vote by roll call? Uh, be happy to. <laughs> All right. Go through the roll call for a motion to adjourn. Trish Holiday? I Yes, I approve. Nick Brassel? Approved. And Richard Chapman. Yes. All right. Motion approved. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Guys. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.